it's very hard to distill a 400 page investigative book uh, into a couple of sentences. But and what I've tried to do, what I have done is I, I've, I don't want to tell people what to think. Um, I wanted to present as an investigative journalist, I wanted to present the facts and the evidence that I'd uncovered. And I wanted to present interviews with people who were very familiar with events that unfolded. For example, uh, Wuhan whistleblowers, Chinese defectors now based in the West, uh, people from the intelligence community, and the politicians or the officials who were either investigating this or who saw um, the very high level intelligence. In terms of my own opinion, which is probably less relevant, I think that, and, and again, the evidence is there for people to make up their own minds, but I think the evidence quite clearly points to a leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, either in mid-September, or at least that's when the Wuhan Institute of Virology became aware of it in mid-September. And then after that, there was the decision, a deliberate decision by Chinese authorities to cover this up. And there's something quite, you know, significant that happens at that time in September, which is with this uh, very large database of viruses. I think you said it's about 22,000 odd viruses. Yes. This was, I think it was one, one third of the viruses in databases in the world or something like this. Yeah, this look, the Wuhan Institute of Virology has the world's largest collection of coronaviruses. It was one of only two uh, laboratories in the world prior to the pandemic who'd been in conducting gain of function research on coronaviruses. And then on the 12th of September 2019, this data database of viruses, 22,000 viruses, as you say, is taken offline mysteriously for the first time. It then reappears online and, and then is, is permanently taken off a few months later. But on that same day that the virus database was taken offline on the 12th of September, the Wuhan Institute of Virology also issued a tender to upgrade its security, beef up its security. And over the following weeks, they spent half a million dollars beefing up their security. And that's both new CCTV systems and also security guards. Uh, they also had a new air ventilation system. They also bought a medical air incinerator and culminating in the purchase of a coronavirus testing PCR machine, uh, that tender was issued on November 6. We only know this information because um, our mutual friend, the cybersecurity experts at Internet 2.0, they've done uh, cybersecurity work for the US government and for the Australian government, that's Robert Potter and Dave Robinson. They managed to, to recover uh, data, th these tender data that had been virtually expunged from the internet. No, and that's that's actually a fascinating uh, set of of I guess you know evidence that I hadn't been familiar with. You've been you've been keeping a tight lid on that before the publication, it seems. <laughs> yes, yeah, and and of course. And of course, there's a lot of other evidence as well that I, that I put together in the book in that window for an outbreak. For example, the fact that the workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology fell sick with COVID-like symptoms, uh, and Mike Pompeo and John Ratcliffe firmly believe uh, that that was, in all likelihood, the first cluster of the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, that then there's the evidence that followed about the uh, General Chen uh, May. She's she was the, um, the you know the the leading army official who went in and took over the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The gag order, uh, the fact that Xi Jinping then issued a new biosecurity law. So so there's a lot of other evidence that points to a laboratory leak as well. And it, this is a pretty fascinating, I guess, vantage point. These three people that fell sick that, you know, a number of officials believe were the beginnings of, of this, I guess, the pandemic, you would say. Yeah. Um, this was actually information that was, you know, that the U.S. intelligence had, but kind of didn't look at for a very long time. Look, this intelligence, according to David Asher, David Asher was one of the lead investigators in the State Department examining the origins of COVID-19 uh, 
in the latter part of 2020, he and his team uncovered this evidence about the sick Wuhan Institute of Virology workers uh, in the intelligence files, and they brought it to the attention of more senior figures like Mike Pompeo. The decision was then made to declassify this intelligence, which happened in January 2021. But David Asher tells me um, in a series of interviews for the book that actually that intelligence that he only discovered in late 2020, he says that came into the possession of the US government an entire year earlier. And uh, also he says this on camera in the documentary I made to go with the book, he says that uh, he, he was shocked when he found that out, that we could have had what he describes as foreknowledge. And he says it could have been like stopping 9-11 before it happened. He describes it as a missed opportunity that no one realized the significance of this intelligence. Um, I actually then asked Secretary of State Mike Pompeo about this when I interviewed him and, and, and said, you know, is he concerned that intelligence seems to have not been acted on? Um, and is this a pandemic that could have in any way been prevented? And Pompeo's response was that this was something he was always concerned about when he was the CIA director, the fact that intelligence was coming in and might not have been processed properly, uh, disseminated properly, and, and did it reach the decision makers. So he suggested it would be well worth having a review or going back to look at what the agencies knew, what was the quality of that intelligence, and, and what happened to it? What did they do with it? Well, and this is very interesting because David Asher, you know, he's part of the Arms Control Verification and Compliance Bureau, AVC. Um, out of the State Department, and it's not necessarily where you would expect this investigation to be run out of. How did that work? Look, that was because there was an assistant secretary or an acting assistant secretary there called Tom DeNano, and he took the initiative to set up uh, an investigation into the origins of COVID-19 and also to examine whether this in any way breached China's obligations under the Biological Weapons Convention to which it is a party under the United Nations. And so they he, he brought in Dave Asher, who was technically a contractor and his other a team, although many others assisted with the investigation as well, like David Stilwell and Miles Yu and, and others, they came across quite strong resistance from members of the intelligence community to even investigating the possibility of a lab leak. And there were other officials, not just the intelligence community, but other bureaucrats, quite senior officials within the State Department who also didn't think that this should be investigated, that it wasn't a matter of um, for the arms control verification unit, that this was just a health policy matter. So they met enormous resistance. Their efforts, as you can see in the book, were, were quite heroic in just, kept, they kept pushing back against these obstacles and, and forging on and demanding answers and uncovering evidence. Um, and and I, I'm thrilled to be able to tell their story in detail because, you know, now it's common knowledge that that intelligence was declassified, but we wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for that team. Well, so let, talking about this, you know, resistance, I remember uh, this uh, nature letter, you know, kind of infamous nature letter put together by a number of very, very prominent scientists that basically declared definitely natural, right? And I remember I have a friend of mine who does vaccine research. He wrote to Nature and said, how can you possibly do this? Like, you know, it's it's one thing to say, you know, there, there's these are the likelihood and so forth. It's another thing to say it's impossible yes. that, that it was anything but a natural origin. Yeah, I think that's right. There were actually two letters. There was one in The Lancet that was drafted by Peter Daszak, and then there was another one that followed it uh, in Nature. And, and both of them were, were came to the same conclusion that in all likelihood, this was um, a natural virus. When in fact, in that early day, this is very early 2020, no investigation had taken place. It was far too early to be making, to be coming to a conclusion that it couldn't have been a genetically manipulated virus. And actually, Jan, when I started reporting on this in early 2020, it was very confusing to me and it, it derailed me for a little while. I didn't understand, you know, the, the, I was looking at the scientific papers um, 
you know, as you guys were, and I was seeing that there was the genetic manipulation of coronaviruses, that there was gain of function research. And I was writing about this in, in the newspaper I write for in Australia. But yet all of the scientists that were speaking publicly were saying this is a virus that has not been genetically manipulated. And I found that quite confusing and, and I didn't understand how that could be the case until, of course, I came across some scientists like Nikolai Petrovsky and then others. And we now know <laughs> that the techniques that have been used uh, in modern laboratories for genetic manipulation, it, that they don't leave a trace. This is the noceum technique that was pioneered by Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina. He was working with Shi Zheng Li and you cannot tell if a virus has been genetically manipulated unless the scientist wants you to tell it and, and leaves a marker or such. This is something that Ralph Barrick um, has, has admitted publicly, even in interviews about the about COVID-19, about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So, you know, this was an incredibly misleading statement from parts of the scientific community. We, we were given this false impression that there was a scientific consensus that this was a natural virus. We were told in that Lancet letter that it was a conspiracy to suggest this was a lab leak. And as it turned out, many of the scientists behind that letter were incredibly conflicted. Peter Dajic, for instance, as, as you know, has was working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for 15 years. But his role in drafting and organising that letter didn't become clear for about 11 months until Gary, Gary Ruskin from the US Right to Know Group did an FOI and uncovered those emails in November 2020 that exposed Dajic's role in this. So really the public was terribly misled and, and unfortunately, it meant that throughout the whole of 2020, the, the narrative, the chosen narrative of the world's largest authoritarian regime took hold at the expense of finding out the truth. In June of this year, over a year after the original Lancet letter was published, an addendum to the letter was published with more information about Peter Daszak's prior research in China. The Lancet did not respond to a request for further comment. So Sherry, you mentioned Xi Zheng Li. Uh, for anyone following this story, they're intimately familiar with her. Why don't you tell us who she is? She was the uh, leading virologist at the Wuhan, or she is the leading virologist at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. She's become known as the bat woman globally, famous for her work in bat coronaviruses. And she was working with Peter Daszak. They were going out to caves, taking bat samples, hundreds and hundreds of bat samples, and taking them back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, where they were sequencing them. And then some of the samples they were just putting in freezers, and other samples they were doing uh, scientific research on. And they were working with some of them on animals and some of them in petri dish or cell dishes. What's crucial about her work is that in 2012, um, some miners who were clearing out guano or bat uh, manure from a cave in, in the Yunnan province, it's, it's called the Mojang Mine, three of the six miners, they all fell sick and three of them died. The next year, Shi Zheng Li and a team from the Wuhan Institute of Virology went and collected bat samples from that cave. And they brought those bat samples back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. One of those samples was a, a, a partial sequence. I don't know if I'm going into too much detail here, but a, a partial sequence was um, uploaded to, to GenBank. And that partial sequence actually had a, a, a 98 over a 98% sequence identity to SARS-CoV-2. It was uh, labelled 4991. Then fast forward uh, about, well, it was uploaded in 2016. Then you fast forward to the start of the pandemic and the, Xi Zheng Li disclosed a virus called RATG13, which had a 96% sequence identity to SARS-CoV-2 and was meant to have been the, the full genetic sequence, not just the partial um, RDRP that was uploaded back in 2016. So 
Very significant that the closest coronavirus we've seen in the world to SARS-CoV-2 came from that mine where they were doing the sampling work. Peter Dajic said that that sample that they collected had just been sitting in the freezers the whole of this time. It then turned out because of the incredible work of researchers who go open source researchers who who go by the name of Drastic, they were then able to uncover that in fact, that virus had been taken out of the freezer on multiple occasions through from 2016 to 2020. But we do not know definitively what work was done on it, what research they did with it. And when I've interviewed Nikolai Petrovsky, he makes the case that a virus like this, either this virus itself or another similar virus, a relative, could have been the precursor to SARS-CoV-2, you know, depending on what sort of research was undertaken if a chimeric virus was made, because that's what they were doing in that lab. They were they were taking gen- genetic sequences from one virus, putting them onto a backbone of another virus, adding in a different spike protein, and, and then ending up with a brand new virus that had never existed in nature before. And they were seeing whether these viruses could infect humans. And in doing so, making them able to infect humans.